This is always a very special gathering. It's the anniversary of uh, Rudy's passing. Call it his Samadhi Day. And this is 40 some years since he passed and we're still here. And I think if there's ever a testament to somebody, it's that people still gather in their name and still are able to draw from the well and from the gift that was given so long ago. I know that I'm sitting here today because Rudy sat in his own time, his own place, and I found him. And that's what teachers are, really. They're, they're people who reflect the moment right back to you. And you would think that everybody in life reflects the moment back to you, but in truth it's so odd, but most people very rarely reflect anything but their confusion and their tensions and their aspirations and their dramas and everything else. But to reflect the moment is hard because very few people ever really discover the moment that they're in. Rudy was very specific to his place and time, which is, of course, always the making of a great teacher. In a way, he was timeless, but also he was very 1960s, 1970s America. And there was something happening in a very big way in America at that moment. There was a big eruption of <clears throat> transformation and possibility, and I certainly was touched by that. We had, as a country, come out of great privation, uh, depression, war. Um, things were finding a real stability in a way. The 1950s were when I was coming of age and things were as stable, I think, in America as they've ever been. Probably, maybe as they ever will be. But it was also strangely stagnant. It was, everybody was in a good place. Middle class America was very strong. And hope and promise and future and all of these ideas came out of the 50s that children were going to do better than their parents and that the world was somehow known and that we had saved the world from tyranny. All this very remarkable time, but it was also the time of the gray flannel suit and a time when people started to find, find a kind of uh, um, sameness. Um, it, there was a sense that things were known and there's a danger when things are known. Because we all know, somewhere deep inside, we are involved in the greatest mystery imaginable. And so the idea that we know something, that we have a handle on it, that we finally are there, that we have arrived at some kind of, this is how life should be, comes with this very strange little discomfort inside, that little thing that's like the pearl inside a oyster. You know, it's this discomfort that's grinding away, saying, really? Is this really what it is? Is this all there is? I mean, this comes on very, very strongly when you're too comfortable. And there's also the fear of can you hold on to it. So the fear and the discomfort are both annoyances that start to form something really powerful. And what happened in the 60s, which was really kind of remarkable, was we started to get a very clear glimpse that there were problems in that simple, beautiful America. There were whole classes of people who were being uh, disparaged and had been for, for many, many uh, decades and centuries. There were, there were, under, there were underclasses. There, there were people who were considered to be perversions of what should be. There was a sense of something not quite right. And slowly that began to be become more visible because everything else was so fine, everything else was so okay. The imperfections were starting to really reveal themselves and that was really remarkable and there was some sense that something should be done. 
And I remember the civil rights movement that became very alive when I was in high school. And I was part of a very left-wing progressive group in those days. And, and we used to go downtown to Woolworth and pick it and go, um, we shall not, we shall not be moved. You know, we, 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 would, we would try to change the world from the outside. And, um, and there's something very noble about that. And, and I was very driven. I would have probably become a Bernie Sanders kind of person. I kind of look like him if I do this. <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and I think that was the road that I was about to go on. And then the other thing that happened in the 60s, which is really quite remarkable, was this the drug uh, revolution, the LSD that came in. And, and I, you all know my story, but I took a big overdose of LSD, and everything shattered. All of known reality shattered. Everything that I thought I understood, all the purpose, all of the simplicity of life, all of the knownness of it was blown away, and there was absolute nothing that I could grasp. Nothing. And I didn't know what to do with any of it. And I was very, very uh, compelled by it, because I knew I had seen outside the box. I had gone outside the room that we all live in, and I had seen something so much beyond and so other, and all I cared about was, what is that? And so I began the journey, which all of the people around me who were doing drugs at the time were doing, which was the journey to the East, because it seemed to be the one place where people were talking about other kinds of consciousness. I got very caught up in the idea of uh, the Tibetan teachings, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And then I started to discover Hindu mysticism. Then I discovered Jewish mysticism and Christian mysticism and realized that the, the great teachings of our religions at their core all stemmed from the same kind of experience that I had. And I was so unprepared for what this all was. And I came back from a year and a half traveling in Asia, having sought for a teacher, anyone who could teach me how to deal with this largeness and not finding them and coming back to New York City and four blocks from where I had begun this journey around the world is Rudy sitting in his store just quietly <coughs> selling Buddhist Hindu called then Oriental Asian antiques and you know I tried to sell him a carpet a Tibetan carpets for these that came from the monks I had lived with in Kathmandu and I tried to sell them to him, and he wasn't interested at all. Mm. But he asked what I was doing in India, and I said I'd gone to find a teacher. He said, did you find one? I said, no. He said, well, I can teach you everything you want to know. <laughs> and it was true. I knew it. I do it. I mean, it, other people had said that to me, but it didn't register. He registered. And I don't know why he registered, but I began to sense that this man had the thing I needed. And it was really interesting because what he had was something unlike so many other teachers. He was very much of the world. He was not someone who said, go back to India, sit in a monastery, sit and meditate your, for the rest of your life. He was, he was a person who said, this life is your spiritual life. This is it. And your life is not working basically. And he didn't say it just to me, but to all of us kids who came to him, all of us, what were we, in our 20s probably, 30s, teens even, we would come to Rudy saying, teach me how to get there. And he would basically say, you're in such a horrible place here, you've got to work this out. You've got to get your life to work. And I remember, it was really so wonderful, you know, Rudy, one of the first compliments he ever paid me, he said, Bruce, when you first came to me, you were like diarrhea. Now you're a solid turd. Congratulations. And, and I, I treasure that to this day. And I don't know if I've graduated beyond that. But the solidity, the solidity has, is everything. And, and, and the one thing that I really learned from Rudy is... You have to get your life together. You have to make it work. It has to be whole. And so many people that I would meet on the Buddhist path, on the Hindu path, on the road to Kathmandu in the 60s, were all running from their lives. Everybody was running. 
We all wanted to get away from who we were, what we were, the society we didn't like, the things that didn't work. We wanted to get somewhere else. And the journey to somewhere else is something very deep in all of us because we all somehow think in some fundamental way that we're not really right, that things aren't right inside. We all feel that because they're not. And it's not because we're bad people or incomplete people. It's because we're human and what we're really looking for is not in the body-mind construct. It's deeper than that. And the search outwardly in the world will not ever get you there. The world does not contain what you're looking for. You think it does. True love, job satisfaction, family, progeny, whatever it is you think is going to give you, oh, I finally did it. Not true. It will not take care of what we might call the existential problem of being human, which is that you are a very temporal, transient entity, that you are not built to last. You know, you're like a car that's going to break down and there's only so many repairs they can do before you're just in the junkyard. And we're all in that. Every one of us is in that. And it's a horrible condition to be in if you're identified with being the car or being the person or being the body. As long as you have that identity, you are going to feel terrified of what it's going to be to not be that. And every human being, I don't care who you're looking at, I don't care where they are on the planet, how high up the ladder they've gone, has that same issue. Because you can't buy your way out of it. But once you have had something like LSD explode you, or a mystical experience, it doesn't have to be drug-oriented, something that shows you is you stick your head outside of the, the realm of the universe that we know and see that it's nothing but this speck of something vast, in the vastness that we can't even contemplate, that's when you start to go, huh, there's something else going on here, and what do I do about it? Rudy did something really interesting. He started to repair me, and he repaired me by basically leading me to this idea that I needed to become whole, and another word which I think has become very important for me is fulfilled. I needed to be fulfilled in my life. I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I do know, and I've talked about this before, the first thing I got from the returning from LSD was a directive from some unknowable source that said, Tell people what you saw. That was the first thing. The second directive came when I was, well, partly in the de desert of Afghanistan. I was in the, lying in a, in, a, in a mud hut with three walls and no ceiling, looking up at the stars, and a voice said, you are going to have stories to tell. Then I was on a boat on the Ganges, coming down from, I used to take smoke opium at night, so the hard floor would get softer and softer and softer. <laughs> and I would have this beautiful night, and then it would get harder and harder and harder, and I'd be back. But a voice came to me one of those nights, and it said, you have to create a masterpiece. And it basically was saying, creating a masterpiece would get me free, if you will, of the human condition. It would give me the ticket to what I was looking for. And then slowly, the universe began to open up this idea of becoming a screenwriter, a Hollywood screenwriter. But it did not pave a very easy path for me, or for anybody, honestly, from what I can tell. It doesn't give you easy access. It gives you possibility. But every possibility requires what I call a leap of faith. It's almost a synaptic jump from one neuron to another. If you don't make that leap, you stay stuck wherever you are. So you have to have the courage to make these leaps in life that bring you what you want. And it's really leaps of faith. And if you don't make leaps of faith at the moments that they're presented to you, then you don't move forward. And things don't happen. So I don't know why I was so conditioned to making leaps of faith, but I... Not only did I do it, but I married a woman, I married Blanche, who was as willing to hold hands and jump with me, which is an amazing, amazing th piece of luck in life and, and blessing, if you will. And so 
we kept making leaps that brought me to the moment of standing on the stage at the Oscars holding this Oscar. And I knew that I had gotten this thing, not that I cared about it as an Oscar, but I had finished something. That I had become, if you will, fulfilled in a certain worldly sense and that I could leave the world. And my last words on stage that night at the Oscars was, thank you, Rudy. And I said, thank you, Rudy, because I had understood at that moment the path I had gone. And I had understood what fulfillment was up to that moment. But let me tell you something about fulfillment. The next day you have to start all over again, <laughs> getting fulfilled. The fulfillment does not last. It does not linger. I was told um, by the guy who produced Platoon a few days later, he said, well, now you're going to have Oscar-winning screenwriter Bruce Joel Rubin on your tombstone. And I felt, okay. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's good. But I also, I also knew that that didn't mean anything to me. It's not at all what I had been looking for. It was fine. It was good. I had, I had gotten the to totemic thing that said, you now have completed a phase of your life. But it did not say you were done. It just said, onward to the next thing. And I went on to successful screenplays and unsuccessful screenplays, things that were produced, things that were not produced, things that worked from my perspective, things that were shit, that just didn't work. You know, I was in no way blessed with constant, continual achievement. But I had an enormous sense of satisfaction that comes from trying, that comes from making an effort. And I got the sense in each one of the efforts I was making that I was finishing something, I was building something that was meant ultimately to fall away. And I've always been very intrigued by Tibetan sand painters who make these elaborate paintings. They spend a week doing these paintings out of little grains of sand and they're so beautiful. And you look at them and all you want to do is hold on to them forever. And the first thing they do when they're done is blow them away. That's our life, guys. You create the most beautiful life you can create, the best version of it you can create, which has to do with what colors of sand you're given. Some people may be given two colors, some people are given 20 colors. Whatever you're given, make the best version. And the extraordinary thing about Rudy was he knew how important that was. Rudy knew that I and most of the kids around us, Bo, there's a whole group of us, <laughs> We had not done our lives so well up to that point. One of the things I had not done very well is my dad would say, mow the lawn, and I'd mow for half the lawn and say, I'm too tired, Dad. And I'd go away, and he'd have to go finish the lawn. I had all of these things in my life that were not complete, that were not whole. And Rudy created these enormous jobs. He bought these four buildings in New York, and he had anyone who was willing come in and rip down the wallpaper and, and rip up the walls and take down the old stuff off the ceiling, the tin ceilings, and put up new ceilings. I'd never done anything like that in my life. Blanche and I and Bo and a whole bunch of people would go in every day and we would work and work and Rudy basically told me, you are making up for all the times you didn't mow the lawn. <laughs> because you have to do that. You don't get out of here without doing. You don't get out of here free of effort. You have to find the thing in you that will fulfill you. Fulfillment isn't always success. You have to understand that. The biggest problem most of us have is thinking fulfillment is only, let's say, the Oscar, okay, or the Super Bowl, or whatever. How many people win the Super Bowl? You know? Not everybody gets it. Not everybody gets the ring. But you get the trying, you get the journey, you get the experience, you get all the stuff you learn on the field, all the stuff you learn in Hollywood. You learn so many lessons, and all I can tell you is they're great lessons because they build this really extraordinary construct that you're getting ready to blow away. If you're lucky, and I was, it got blown away before I was finished with the physical life. Something came in and just went whoosh. And I just stopped and I went oh. you, you sort of wonder at first, what was that all about? Why did I work so hard? 
Because what gets blown away is all that effort. What gets blown away is the life you lived to, to try to get somewhere, and then the weird place you got to was where you were anyway. And they just blow it away. And I, and, and, and I realized, first of all, that my journey now was the journey not of a person called Bruce, but my journey was the journey of the mystery unfolding. I am the mystery unfolding, but so are you. Every one of us is the mystery unfolding, and not one of us is more central to that mystery. Not one person. That mystery inhabits us. We are the mystery. We can call it God. We can call it love. We can call it infinite, eternal knowing. I, what, you, there's, whatever you want to call it, we don't know what it is. But we are that. And so if you're spending your life living in, oh my God, am I going to win the Oscar? Oh my God, am I going to get that job? Oh my God, how am I, is that girl going to ever look at me? If, if, that, if that's your whole life, <clears throat> It's all wrapped up in this very tiny little space, and when that gets blown away, it's like you hadn't even begun the journey. The journey from your particular life into the vast journey of being is so remarkable. We have to live our lives, we do, and it's helpful to find a teacher who says, get your life together. Because if I hadn't found Rudy, I, I, you know, I don't know what I would do, I'd probably be in some monastery in, in India, except I was lucky. I met a lot of people who were living in monasteries in India. They were some of the unhappiest people I ever met. <laughs> they were in endless search, and they somehow defined themselves by the search. And so when you have an identity of a seeker, you can't afford to become a finder because you're locked into seeking, and that's who you are and what you are. And I, these, I, these people made me so sad. Because I would listen to them, and they were some of them many, many years older than I was, and they'd been in the monastery for, you know, the ashram for 30 years, 40 years, and you look in their eyes, and there's nothing there. Nothing there except adoration for the teacher, or anger at the teacher, because the teacher hasn't delivered. But the teacher cannot deliver, because nothing external can give you what you're looking for. Nothing, no one. I don't care how much they love you, they can't give it to you. You have it already. And if have it, it's the wrong word because that's a possessive. You are it. You are it already. And so what happens to someone like me is there's this wild frustration of wanting you to know it. I just want, to, I just want you to know it. I want you to look here and, 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 or look anywhere and go, this is it. This is the miracle. You're in it. You're of it. You're one with all the mystery that will ever be and you are at the source, the core of it. And why can't I give that to you? Why can't any teacher give that to you? And how do I stop being this boring guy who tells the same thing every time I see you? How do, I don't know how to do it. I could try being, some guys chose this path, it's just being totally quiet. And then you can figure it out based on that. That's almost as good as someone talking to you. On the other hand, if you just keep wondering and wondering what it is, you're not going to get there. You have to go, I want this. I want. And I want my life to be at a point where I can say, ah, I can let it go. One of the biggest things that disrupts people from spiritual attainment, if you want to call it that, or from awakening, is that they're still saying, but my life didn't do this, or I didn't get that, or I never had... Uh, I didn't have grandchildren, or I didn't have children, or I didn't, I didn't, I never won an Oscar, or I didn't get a, a job, or whatever, whatever those not happening things are, those lacks of fulfillment, that's a real problem, because they hold you in place, they keep you from realizing yourself. So get it, get what you're looking for, get what you want, and if it's not going to come, make peace with that. If you get to a certain point you're going to have to say, that's not happening. It's one of the hardest things ever, and I've watched so many people deal with that. You know, it's not happening. It's not going to come. I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to win the Nobel Prize. I'm not going to win the Pulitzer. It's, it's not going to be delivered. Oh, God, and you'll, and you'll spend the rest of your life pining what you didn't get. And that all of that sadness, all of that discomfort, all of that stuff prevents you from seeing the miracle that you are. 
The Nobel Prize will never make you happier than opening your eyes to this. Trust me. I had a teacher named Rudy who taught me how to reach into life, how to work, how to value what life presented, how to grow, as he put it, and how to surrender. How to grow and how to surrender. It almost feels like those contradict each other. Growing seems to be about attainment and about uh, accomplishment, about holding on. And surrender seems to be about letting go. And those are two very different ideas, and yet they are totally complementary. If you can get and have and not be attached, if you can have the world and not care, read Kipling, if you, if you, can, if you can get it all and be free in the midst of it, that is what you're looking for here. Because... One, you can't take it with you. Two, you're leaving. <laughs> Three, it never was meant to be held, only appreciated. That's all it's for. Appreciate. Love what is. Now, I know what it's like to be unhappy and depressed and miserable and unsatisfied. I know what all that feels like, and two results can come from that. One of them is change yourself, and the other is accept yourself. This idea of accepting discomfort, unhappiness, struggle, dissatisfaction, seems like the wrong path. But let me tell you, The vastness of being is filled with every experience and every emotion and every aspect of having and losing. The universe that we live in, the extraordinary dualistic system that we all inhabit, that gives and takes at the same time, is the soup of our life. It's flavored with happiness and misery. It's got everything going on. Don't try to only eat the good part. If you try to have a soup and only eat the letter A, alphabet soup, <laughs> you know, you're, you're gonna you're gonna miss out. You know, if you, if you the, there's it's one big stew, it's one big soup, it's one big thing. And what you really need to learn, what we all need to learn, is yes to this. The idea again, love what is, love what is. That's a hard teaching. But I'll tell you, the mechanism involved in that is surrender. Surrender. Surrender what? Surrender the thing in you that's separate from all that stuff, basically which is judging it, which is saying, I want it to be this way and not that way. Only that way. Only like this. And that comes early on. I, I have a new Korean uh, nephew, and I was with him and my niece. And he just, two, two and a half years old, he suddenly got brought into this family. And it's like, I met him for the first time yesterday. He's uprooted the entire family. He's, I, how they do it, I don't know. I mean, this, this kid speaks no English. He's the cutest thing in the world. He has a dynamo. He just runs down the street. His new sister is this little petite, sweet little person who doesn't know what to do with him. And, and this whole family has totally disrupted. And I'm watching it, and I'm going, what a gift. <laughs> what a gift, because they're going to have to figure out how to deal with encompassing something so much bigger than they ever had before. Disruption, complication is a gift. Discomfort, unhappiness, sadness is a gift. It's just there. When you make it yours and you make it the reason why you can't or you shouldn't or you mustn't or even if the reason to do, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's the best thing to do with all this stuff is go, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. When you start to embrace all these different things, you become this extraordinary human being. This being. You know, we're, people stop at human, but we're actually being. Not even beings, we're being. Being is the source of everything. Our being is what we are. 
We are being, the minute you call it human and then you give it a name and a personality and a history and a story and all of that, you take that being which you are and you squish it down into this tiny little thing that's really uncomfortable and always struggling. Let it go. Surrender. And then you're back to being. And that's what we were given as our birthright, being. And the truth is, we're really good at it. I, you don't have to try to be. You don't have to practice being. You have to practice certain parts of human being, but just being, you don't. And when you surrender, and you surrender your story and your history and why life didn't treat you well or why it did this or did that, you let it go. You're back to being. And the journey to being is sitting still and entering into your own heart. Again, Rudy taught me to do that. Rudy taught me to sit still and discover what I was looking for has always, always been there. And that's something I can tell you. What you're looking for has always been there. It hasn't gone anywhere. You've gone. Come back. Come back. This breathing exercise we do, this double breathing exercise, it's a great tool. Use it. Go into your heart. Open your heart. Feel yourself. Feel life. Feel being alive. Feel like, yes, thank you. Feel that. Know what that is. And, and then why, you're not going to go out there into the world and say, why can't I have it? You have it. You know, if I make $100 million, then I'll get it. Forget that. I, you, know, you know, you can make $100 million and not get anywhere near it. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. What's worth it is what already is, that everybody has a birthright to, everybody has access to, and almost nobody finds. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So occasionally there'll be people like me, people like Rudy, who appear in your life in the moment that you're in and say this to you. That's a gift. To have somebody saying it to you in the moment that you're actually here is an opportunity to hear, hear it and maybe even to do it, to live it, to absorb it, then you become free, even while you're here, or at the worst of it, on your deathbed, which is not the worst. That's a great place to get free. You know? But you don't want to be on your deathbed clinging to the thing you cannot have. You do not want that, because it's not fun. What you want to do is go, yes, thy will be done, and offer this fulfilled, whole, loving human being to that which brought it into being itself. And that's the journey. That's what we're all on. And, you know, as clear as it may be, I wouldn't have known it without Rudy. And although the awakening was not directly related to something Rudy did, it was related to having found a person who said, get your life together. Here's how you meditate. I love you. <coughs> that love part was huge. I remember Rudy hugging me. He hugged me a lot. Hugged all of us. And he would hug us after class, you know. And, and he said to me once, Bruce, this is what love is. It's what you feel when your mother hugs you when you're four years old. That's what love is. And I have looked for that since that moment and find it all the time now. And I give it all the time. Because he taught me how to do that. He taught me how to open my heart, how to live a life with an open uh, throat chakra, an open third eye, an open heart, an open belly, an open sexuality, an open kundalini. He taught me that. And here I am, sitting here trying to share the same thing with each of you. It's a really interesting teaching. Is it the best teaching in the world? I have no idea. There are so many great teachers out there, and there's so many people to learn from. And I, I'm telling you, I've... I keep learning from the most unexpected people. It's always the person sitting next to me on the airplane, if it's not Blanche. You know? There's always somebody, even from Blanche. You, know, you can still learn from your wife, trust me. <laughs> but, I mean, Blanche and I were across the aisle, and I had a guy next to me on the plane, and we talked for th three hours, and it was like, oh my God, I, the, le the lessons were so phenomenal. Everybody is your teacher if you open properly. Everybody. Don't, don't, don't look at anybody and think of them as, oh, that's, they've got nothing to teach. Just the opposite. Everything. If you're open. So, today we celebrate Rudi Samadhi, which is that this extraordinary being came into the world, manifested, 
learned through his own dramas, which were huge, shared what he learned, gave it to those of us lucky enough to meet him, gave us enough of it to keep it going after he departed. And we come here today basically to say thank you. Just thank you for doing that. And people will say thank you to you for having done it if you do it. You know, you don't have to sit and teach in front of a room full of people. You can do it to the people next to you. You can hug them in a particular way. You can thank them. You can be with them. They will thank you. I went to the funeral of a cousin a month or so ago, which why I wasn't here. Uh, he, he was a druggist, a pharmacist, <laughs> in a big pharmacy in Detroit. And a thousand people came to his funeral. A thousand people. I don't, I don't think a thousand people would come to my funeral. He touched a lot of people. He touched a lot of people. We all touch a lot of people. That's our job. Touch, be touched, share, ex exhaust yourself in being present in the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful ride. And I thank you, Rudy, for teaching me that. And I thank you guys for listening to the lessons because they're still pouring forth. And I thank you for coming. <laughs>